the heroes of Gettysburg series, who was Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Dawes. The Battle of Gettysburg began on the morning of July 1, 1863, when Brigadier General John Buford's cavalry engaged Major General Henry Heath's Confederates outside the northwest corner of the town. Buford's objective was to delay the rebel advance long enough for Union infantry to arrive and set up a defensive position on favorable ground. Major General Reynolds' 1st Corps was the first Federal infantry to arrive. One of these 1st Corps units was the Iron Brigade, consisting of the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin, the 19th Indiana, and the 24th Michigan Infantry Regiments. Upon arriving at the scene of the fighting, the Iron Brigade regiments, with the exception of the 6th Wisconsin, were ordered forward into Herps Woods to engage the Tennessee and Alabama regiments of Brigadier Gen General James Archer's Brigade. The 6th Wisconsin was ordered to cross the Chambersburg Pike on the right and support Brigadier General Lysander Cutler's brigade as it faced General Joseph Davis's brigade of Mississippi and North Carolina troops. Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Dawes was in command of the 6th Wisconsin Infantry that day. Dawes wrote some excellent post-war accounts of his experiences in the Iron Brigade. Here are some excerpts from one of his accounts of the 6th Wisconsin at Gettysburg. The regiment halted at the fence along the Cashdown Turnpike, and I gave the order to fire. In the field beyond the turnpike, a long, irregular line of yelling Confederates could be seen, running forward and firing, and our troops were running back in disorder. The fire of our carefully aimed muskets resting on the fence rails, striking their flank, checked the rebels in their headlong advance. We could see the thin regiments of Cutler's Brigade beyond the turnpike were being almost destroyed. The rebel line swayed and bent, and the men suddenly stopped firing and ran into the railroad cut, which is parallel to the Cashtown turnpike. I now ordered the men to climb over the turnpike fences and advance upon them. I was not aware of the existence of a railroad cut and mistook the maneuver of the enemy for a retreat, but was soon undeceived by the heavy fire which they began at once to pour upon us from their cover in the cut. Captain John Tickner, a dashing soldier, one of the finest officers, fell dead while climbing the second fence, and others were struck, but the line pushed on. When over the fence and in the field and subjected to an eternal fire, I saw the 95th New York Regiment coming gallantly into line upon our left. Farther to the left was the 14th Brooklyn Regiment, but we were ignorant to the fact. The 95th New York had 100 men in action. Major Edward Pye appeared to be in command. Running hastily to the Major, I said, We must charge, and asked him if they were with us. The gallant major replied, Charge it is, and they were with us to the end. Forward charge was the order given by both the major and myself. We were now receiving a fearfully destructive fire from the hidden enemy. Men who had been shot were leaving the ranks in crowds. Any correct picture of this charge would represent a V-shaped crowd of men with the colors at the advance point moving firmly and hurriedly forward while the whole field behind is streaming with men who had been shot and who are struggling to the rear or sinking in death upon the ground. Meanwhile, the colors were down upon the ground several times, but they were raised at once by the heroes of the color guard. Not one of the guard escaped, every man being killed or wounded. 420 men started as a regiment from the turnpike fence, of whom 240 reached the railroad cut. Years afterward, I found the distance passed over to be 175 paces. Every officer proved himself brave, true, and heroic in encouraging the men to breast this deadly storm, but the real impetus was the eager, determined valor of our men who carried muskets in the ranks. The rebel color would be seen waving defiantly just above the edge of the railroad cut. Corporal Eggleston of Company H, a mere boy, sprang forward to seize it, and he was shot dead the moment his hands touched the color. Private Anderson of his company, furious at the killing of this brave young comrade, swung aloft his musket and with a terrific blow split the skull of the rebel who had shot the young Eggleston. Into this deadly melee rushed Corporal Francis A. Waller, who seized and held the rebel bag battle flag. His, his name will remain upon the historic record as he received from Congress a medal for his deed. 
It would require many pages to justly reaccount the heroic deeds of all, but one incident is so touching in its character that it should be preserved. Corporal James Kelly of Company B turned from the ranks and stepped beside me as we both moved hurriedly forward on the charge. He pulled open his woolen shirt and marked where the deadly minier ball had entered his breast and was visible. He said, Colonel, won't you please write to my folks that I died a soldier? My first notice that we were immediately upon the enemy was a general cry from our men of, Throw down your muskets! Down with your muskets! Running quickly forward through the line of men, I found myself face to face with at least a thousand rebels, who I looked down upon in the railroad cut, which was here about four feet deep. Adjunct Brooks, equal to the emergency, had quickly placed men across the cut in position to fire through it. I shouted, Where is the colonel of this regiment? An officer in gray with stars on his collar who stood among the men in the cut said, Who are you? I said, I'm the commander of this regiment. Surrender or I will fire on you. The officer replied not a word but promptly handed me his sword and his, all his men who still held them threw down their muskets. The 6th Wisconsin captured 232 prisoners in the action in the railroad cut. The regiment was then ordered to a new position on Sem Seminary Ridge to support Battery B of the 4th U.S. Artillery, but Confederate forces were advancing in great strength from both the West and North, and it was time for the 1st Corps to withdraw. Lieutenant Clayton E. Rogers, an aide on General Wadsworth's staff, came riding rapidly up to us. Leaning over from his horse, he said very quietly, The orders, Colonel, are to retreat beyond the town. Hold your men together. I, I was astonished, but a glance over the field to our right and rear was sufficient. There the troops of the 11th Corps appeared in full retreat, and the long lines of Confederates with fluttering banners and shining steel were sweeping forward in pursuit. The 6th Wisconsin retreated through Gettysburg, exchanging shots with rebel soldiers in the streets, and finally reaching Cemetery Hill. The regiment was then ordered to Culp's Hill, where it would rejoin the rest of the Iron Brigade. The 6th Wisconsin saw some light action on July 2nd, and received artillery fire on the 3rd, but so saw no more large-scale fighting in the battle. Casualty figures vary slightly by source, but the regiment had about 167 total casualties, including 30 men killed out of 340 engaged. The action of the 1st Corps helped delay the Confederate advance and bought the Army of the Potomac valuable time to arrive and prepare a strong defensive position, setting the stage for the Union victory on July 3rd. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. And love it.